Welcome to our supplement to lecture 7. In lecture 7 we were talking about polysaccharides and I want to take a few minutes to tell you about money that you can make with polysaccharides. Chemistry and biochemistry included is really in my opinion another word for money. It's a huge part of industry from petroleum to plastics uh, to medicine and of course food. And polysaccharides are a food and let's look at things that we can make money with that are derived from foods. We can turn polysaccharides into commercial materials and we can turn polysaccharides uh, into useful things like, like beer. Now beer is made from barley and of course barley is full of starch. You may be familiar with the Barbarian Beer Law and the Barbarian Beer Law of 1516 says that beer can only contain starch from barley, hops and water. That's it. They didn't even allow yeast. Of course, in 1516, they had no clue what was turning uh, barley into beer. I bet their fourth ingredient would have been God. They probably would have said there's only four ingredients, barley, hops, water, and God. But really, it was yeast. Yeast was doing the chemistry. And the chemistry of yeast, which is the chemistry of fermentation or anaerobic glycolysis, was one of the first mountains that biochemistry climbed. And you can imagine, because there was so much money in wine and beer, it was the search for exactly what was happening with sugar that led to the elucidation of really the first uh, important biochemical pathway. So money drives biochemistry, biochemistry makes money. Along the way, uh, enzymes were characterized. Look at this enzyme here. This is amylase. It is an enzyme that breaks down starches at pH 7. You don't have to boil your barley in sulfuric acid. You just, at pH 7, at room temperature, this enzyme will catalyze the same reaction. It will make that reaction millions of times faster than it would be in the absence of that catalyst. And that's what protein catalysts do. They make a specific reaction really fast. So if that protein is around, that's basically the only reaction you're going to see because you're only going to see the fastest reaction. If it's a million times faster than every other possibility, it is the only thing you're going to see. So processing starch with yeast to make beer was really important and a huge industry and it still is today. Let's talk about corn. Corn is a massive industry, especially in North America. There are piles of corn 100 feet deep and a mile wide in the United States to feed cattle and stuff. Well, corn is an important industrial material as well, not just feedstock for cattle and a nice little barbecue treat for us. Um, look at the things that we can make from corn. We can make corn starch, corn oil, and corn syrup. What I want to talk about here is the transition from corn starch to corn syrup. Once you've extracted the corn oil and you have the corn starch, uh, that's nice. Can we turn it into something valuable like corn syrup, which we can put in Coca-Cola and sell tons of and make lots of money? And how would we make corn syrup and what is it? Well, let's talk about uh, starting with the starch. And now we could do this with sulfuric acid, but it's going to give you a higher quality product if you just do it under mild conditions with an enzyme catalyst. So there are companies out there that make amylases for companies that make high fructose corn syrup. So there's biochemistry involved here. There are companies that are uh, extracting, overexpressing, purifying amylases, uh, genetically engineering them to be a little bit better than some other companies' amylases. And they're selling, my amylase is gonna turn your, your corn starch into these maltoses and maltodextrins really easily. And then you can buy my glucoamylase, which I've uh, purified for you, which will take all of those maltodextrins and turn it into glucose. Now I have a big bucket of glucose. And guess what? Glucose, it doesn't really taste the way you think it should. You think, oh, glucose, that's great. Uh, that must be sweet. But the simple fact of the matter is, is glucose isn't for some reason, glucose, I, I don't know, it's like that uncanny valley of sugars. You, It's sweet, but it's not sweet enough. It tastes off because it doesn't taste like sucrose. Glucose is not sucrose. And sucrose is what we think of as that nice, pleasant, sweet smell. But guess what tastes a lot like sucrose? A mixture of fructose and glucose. So we had another enzyme that we can buy, glucose isomerase, which will catalyze the equilibrium between the glucose form of this hexose and its fructose form. We only have to change the oxidation state of two, sh of two carbons, uh, just moving a few protons around. So it's a really easy reaction to do. It would happen in acid or base just on its own, but it'd be very slow or fairly slow. Here it is happening at pH seven really quickly because of this enzyme. So if we have these three enzymes present in our sort of uh, slurry of starch, pretty quickly we're gonna turn it into a mixture of glucose 
and fructose. And so we've got this mixture of glucose and fructose, and now we have a much sweeter product because fructose is much sweeter than glucose. Bees know this. And if you eat honey, what you're eating is a lot of what we would call inverted sugar. And what inverted sugar is, it's sucrose that's just been hydrolyzed by an enzyme in the bee's saliva to glucose and fructose. And the reason it's called inverted sugar is because the optical rotation of sucrose, here it is, plus 66, and the optical rotation of glucose, or dextrose, is positive, but the optical rotation of fructose, or levulose, for the left-hand turn it puts on light, uh, is an even bigger negative number. So if you get a 50-50 mixture of these, because you started with a 50-50 uh, combination in sucrose, you're going to have an inversion of the optical rotation. That's all invert sugar means. Um, basically, if you add an enzyme to sucrose, the optical rotation inverted. What happened? This. And uh, so that was one of the first sort of biochemical reactions that was investigated in detail. And, and it's actually the reaction that was used by Michaelis and Menten to come up with their famous Michaelis-Menten equation. There's basically a reaction mechanism that would uh, occur in acid, and you can imagine that enzymes are going to probably mimic this process through acid-base chemistry and uh, stabilizing the carbocation intermediate. There's the enzyme, invertase, and this picture here is a backbone trace. Basically, I have just taken the atoms of the backbone, the nitrogen, the alpha carbon, and the carbonyl carbon of all the amino acid residues and a line, and I've just basically made a a sort of a line fit of them, and that's what the rope traces. And these shapes, these yellow ribbons and red helices, are just graphical codes for the way the hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds are aligned in a sheet-like arrangement called beta sheets or in a helix-like arrangement called alpha helices. And we'll talk more about how these pictures work a little later in the course. But notice that you can clearly see, because of the backbone trace, that invertase is two identical proteins that have a face-to-face -face arrangement. So there's one, turn 180 degrees, it matches up with itself. So it's a dimer of proteins, and that's the active form. And we'll see that kind of structural property in proteins as we proceed through this course. This is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. There's clever things you can do with invertase. You could take fondant, which is a you know mixture rich in sucrose, and it's a very stiff material. Well, I mean, relatively stiff. Certainly, you could make a ball out of it, and it stays a ball. But you could mix in some invertase that you buy from a supplier who's making money selling you invertase. And you mix the invertase into that fondant. And because it's a, a solid material, the reaction is going to be very slow. But as things get more liquid, it will speed up, be more chemically available to get at all the sucrose molecules. Inside this Cadbury egg, the fondant is going to turn into, from the crystalline sucrose, to a less crystalline mixture of glucose and fructose. You know, honey is liquid, right? Cane sugar is solid. Sucrose is a nice crystalline material. Inverted sugar is liquid. So there you go. How did they get the creamy center into the Cadbury milk egg? It started out as a fairly solid fondant, and this enzyme inverted it inside the egg. That's cool. That reaction is happening while it sits on the grocery shelf. Here's sort of a sweetness score for sugars. Notice how much sweeter fructose is than glucose. Fructose is more than twice as sweet as glucose. It's almost twice as sweet as sucrose. If you had a 50-50 mixture of glucose and fructose, you can see that the middle is going to be about here. It would be sweeter than sucrose. So you don't want 50-50. What you're going to do is you're going to take that 50-50 mixture of fructose and glucose, and you're going to add back in a little pure glucose and get to 42%. High fructose corn syrup. 42%, that's your goal. So you're going to add your glucose isomerase, you're going to let it reach equilibrium, which is not quite 50-50, but you'll add back in a little bit of the uh, original glucose till you get to the magic point, 42%. And your high fructose corn syrup can come in a number of different percentages, 42% uh, being the one that's closest to sucrose. So let's put that in our Coca-Cola and let's uh, sell it to all kinds of companies and let's make money. Speaking of money, and one good way to make money is to win a Nobel Prize. Get busy. And where does all that money come from? Where did Nobel's fortune come from? It came from this, war. And uh, his dad was a munitions maker, and uh, they made a lot of explosives, you can imagine, um, um, for armies and things, as well as the construction industry. It's not... Uh, uh, not all about killing people. Um, but of course, one of the problems with explosives is they might explode on you. And Nobel's brother, Emil, died in the factory making nitroglycerin. So obviously, 
Nobel said, I want a better material. And uh, so he invented dynamite. Um, but along the way, he also used another material uh, called nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose is cellulose that has been nitrated. And you can imagine that um, that's going to burn really, really well. Look at all these extra oxygens. These oxygens are going to help all these carbons turn to carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. These nitrogens in the reaction will just turn to nitrogen gas. You're going to turn this cellulose, won't just burn like paper. It's going to burn super, super fast. And that's what you want for gunpowder. Nitrocellulose replaced gunpowder. Um, it burns really fast, really brightly, and leaves almost no residue. If you've ever seen a magician use flash paper, that's what flash paper is. It's this nitrocellulose. And you notice it doesn't explode. It just burns really fast because that's what you don't. That's what you want. You don't want the gunpowder in your gun to explode, be completely done before your bullet has even moved a millimeter. You'd have developed so much pressure, your gun would explode. You want it to burn really fast and be completely burned just before the bullet leaves the gun. So the bullets traveled, you know, six inches up the barrel, two feet up the barrel, whatever. You're burning the whole time, pushing it like a rocket the whole time, but you're not developing that sudden pressure wave that would explode your gun. So you want something to deflagrate, not detonate. And that's what nitrocellulose does. You know what detonates? Nitroglycerin. Now, nitrocellulose was discovered by uh, Sean Bein here, and um, he was basically working with sugars and, and cooking them in every acid he could come up with, and he came up with a way, a nice sort of predictable way of creating nitrocellulose. Other people had made it before, but he was the one who kind of created the industrial synthesis for it. So uh, I hope he got some money from that. So Brero was the man who invented nitroglycerin. And uh, guess who was his student? Uh, Nobel, Alfred Nobel. And Sobrero, uh, he was terrified of nitroglycerin. He saw it blowing up all the time in his face and in his students' faces. And uh, so he was terrified of it. He saw it as basically the devil. And uh, he spent his life uh, basically alternating between criticizing Alfred Nobel for making money off of nitroglycerin through dynamite and also demanding credit and money for the discovery. Um, so uh, a conflicted man. Uh, Nobel, one of his other discoveries was he discovered that if you mixed nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin, you could kind of, you know, move that deflagration detonation border around. You could basically change the speed it burned. And he developed cordite, or a version of cordite, um, that, well, it became the, uh, the propellant of choice for bullets. And uh, from the Boer War on, uh, bullets were propelled by cordite. That meant that you could fire a lot more before you had to clean your gun. It also made machine guns possible because you could fire, obviously, hundreds of bullets out of a single gun now because you didn't worry about it gumming up in, like, you know, 10 seconds. Um, you only had to worry about it overheating. That was another problem. But they can solve that through engineering. Speaking of engineering, what does that look like? That looks like money to me. That is a pulp and paper factory. And this factory converts trees into paper. And of course, paper is big business. Um, I bet you printed out these slides, even though I keep telling you not to. You can look at them on your computer screen. But think of the paper you are using. And where does that paper come from? Well, it comes from cellulose. And originally, well, uh, I'm not going to go right back to the ancient days when they're using papyrus, but a common source of paper in the 1800s was cotton. And so you had like really fine, high cotton uh, paper. And that was, uh, it was very high quality paper because cotton has a lot of crystalline regions in its cellulose. And so it's a very strong material. But what also has a lot of cellulose is trees. But there's a bit of a problem there. I'll tell you about it in a sec. These are the two guys who made uh, major advances in pulp and paper technology. They basically engineered the machinery. They each had an independent invention. They were unaware of each other's work. Um, Fennerty here was a Canadian. He was actually a Nova Scotian, and we're, of course, familiar with the Picto pulp mill. Um, there is many a day when I was growing up here in Prince Edward Island that you would step out your door and say, I smell that pulp mill from 100 miles away. So um, a lot of chemistry happening, a lot of smells coming from that pulp mill. And why was there so much chemistry? Don't you just grind up a tree? Well, the problem was lignin. The cellulose in trees is bound up in lignin as part of the cell walls of the plant cells. And lignin is, look at it, it's a very cross-linked phenolic resin. This is just like the resin in fiberglass. And that's why trees can be so tall. This is why, uh, well, this was a huge biochemical innovation uh, at the start of the Carboniferous era when plants began to be able to make lignin. Because then you had these resin-like materials combined with the fibrous 
uh, cellulose. And what did you have? Like carbon fiber. You had resin and fiber. Fiberglass, resin and fiber. And so you had something that could be made incredibly strong. Strong enough to stand way up high and take all the light. And of course, it just became a race to the top after that. And uh, I, I, I'm just sort of making a hobby of studying you know, the history of oxygen uh, in our atmosphere. And, and one thing that this may have given rise to is because there was no bacteria at that time that could process lignin, the trees couldn't rot. So they just fell over and got buried and all the oxygen that was liberated fixing that carbon stayed in the atmosphere. It didn't just get used up metabolizing um, the uh, uh, carbon that had just been fixed. And so because you buried these huge sheets of coal, you increased the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. And what happened shortly after the Carboniferous, we had much bigger animals uh, and of course ultimately the dinosaurs. It's because there was so much oxygen in the atmosphere you could actually support bigger animals. So lignin might have been you know, an important change in life on Earth. Certainly uh, it enabled trees to grow high and it's a problem for pulp and paper chemists. You've got to get rid of this. All kinds of chemistry to just get rid of this. Heavy bleaching stuff. All kinds of oxidized products coming out. Everything causes cancer. So if you can come up with a better way, a more gentle way of removing lignin from cellulose in trees, you will get rich. So think about that. And people have been working on this for a long time. A hundred years ago, they built this building here at McGill University. Um, I went to the auto mass chemistry building for my graduate studies, which would, it's not, you can't see it here. It would be right here in this empty space. This was the first, one of the first chemistry buildings at McGill. And it was the, basically the Department of Cellulose Chemistry. It became the Pulp and Paper Research Institute. Um, and so obviously a lot of research to be done in this important industrial uh, use of cellulose. And of course, as you can imagine, um, people do still complain about the smell of that pulp mill in Nova Scotia. Maybe someday we'll have a perfect odorless way of dealing with pulp. But until then, we will have to live with the byproducts if we want paper. So don't print out these slides. Just enjoy my lectures and read the slides on your screen or on your uh, tablet. Here's another sort of biochemical issue or opportunity, problem and opportunity we're having here. Um, these are sea squirts or tunicates. And these are a whole bunch that have growing on a rope underwater. And look, where's the rope? Can you see the rope? I can't see the rope. These things totally gum up the works everywhere they go. And now that's all fine if there's sort of fish or predators that eat them. But we have invasive tunicate species that are showing up in PEI. And what they're doing is they're choking out the mussel industry. They're completely covering the mussel socks. And they compete for the food that the mussels eat. More importantly, uh, these sea squirts, they're just squishy, gooey things. They're animals, but they're just really squishy, gooey, sponge-like things. They're all water. They increase the weight. Think of how heavy this rope is now. You're not just picking up a rope. You're picking up a ton of water that's inside these tunicates. And so they make everything so heavy, and they damage equipment and make it just tougher to work. Um, so what can you do with these? Well, um, they've just been kind of developing machines to grind them off the uh, socks and, and ways to slow their growth. But it turns out there's an opportunity here. Tunicates have been discovered to be rich in a material called microcrystalline cellulose. As I've told you before, cellulose has these crystalline regions. They react more slowly in acid than the amorphous regions. So I can hydrolyze the amorphous regions into individual glucose units and leave the crystalline units, you know, with careful control of my conditions, I can end up with a high yield of this crystalline cellulose material. And what can you do with that? Well, it makes fibers. Now you can get microcrystalline cellulose out of pulp and paper, or out of pulp. You can get microcrystalline cellulose from lots of sources, but this is coming from tunicates. And it turns out that the tunicate microcrystalline regions are a lot longer than the microcrystalline regions in other natural uh, fibers. So what they're doing is they're making these nano whiskers out of microcrystalline cellulose. And these nano whiskers from microcrystalline cellulose are much longer than the nano whiskers that you can get from pulp sources, which means they're more suitable for putting in things like fiber enforced resins. The pulp and paper material is more used for pill coatings and, and other more specialized uses, but this could be used for actual sort of like a green source of carbon fiber. It could become a real commercial material and we could be making money scraping the sea squirts off of the mussels as well as selling those delicious and tasty mussels. Um, I just want to have a short rant here where I'm just going to say microcrystalline cellulose makes nano whiskers. Micro is a thousand times bigger than nano. So I think we need to have some type of an international commission to regulate the use of the word nano. Otherwise, we're going to get in trouble. Uh, the space aliens are going to come and get us if we use the word nano too much. Look up who this guy is, and you'll know why. 
So delicious mussels could be a source of lots more than just tasty meat. Look at all these mussels being pulled up. Imagine if they were completely covered with tunicates and that crane could barely lift this big long row of mussel socks. Uh, maybe it would just snap off. These poor guys would have to work five times harder if we, uh, but let's reward them. Let's buy those tuna kits from them and make microcrystal and cellulose. And all these companies will have an increased source of money and uh, more money for everybody. Money, money, money. That's what biochemistry can give us. Here's a interesting product, pectin. Have you ever made jam? Or has your ever seen jam being made? Um, well, you might add pectin to thicken it up. And pectin is a, a natural thickener that's that's uh, in high concentrations in fruit. So, you know, fruits have natural pectins. That's why you add a whole bunch of sugar, boil it up, reduce the water uh, amount, and hopefully uh, the pectin will thicken it up. And if it doesn't thicken it up, you can add some uh, uh, extra pectin. Notice the linkage here in pectin. It's a polymer of galactose. So this four carbon here in the, you know, glucose would be sticking out. In galactose, it's sticking up. And it creates this kind of stereochemistry for the uh, alpha-1,4 linkage. This is an alpha-1,4 linkage between galactose and, well, another galactose. Compare it to <coughs> what you see in glucose. Notice the different stereochemistry. That gives it different properties, as well as the fact that the galactose is oxidized. This is galactuuronic acid. And some of it is in these esters. If you ferment um, sort of a pectin-rich material, um, you might get some methanol uh, coming out as well because of these... Uh, chemical groups, and that might give your uh, drink a little extra kick if it doesn't blind you. Um, now, if you, you know, don't have fruit that's got enough pectin in it, or if you want a little help, you can buy pectin at the grocery store, cheat a little, and make fantastic jam. Here's another polymer that you'll find in uh, living things. This is something you'll find in lobster, and this is chitin. It looks like cellulose, but it's all the glucoses have been aminated here at the number two carbon. And so we've got these amino glucoses, and then of course we have acetylated them. So this is basically, you know, uh, amino acetylated glucose. And it's a long polymer, and it's of course it's entrained with collagen and calcium and a whole bunch of other stuff that makes the shell of lobster. Now, lobster shells are a major byproduct of our seafood industry. What could we do with them? Could we take lobster shells and do something interesting with them? Well, maybe we could extract chitin. Uh, Brackenote here was the, uh, uh, he discovered chitin, and uh, Hoffman uh, was the man who figured out the formula for chitin, and Hoffman, of course, is famous. He's famous for another molecule, isn't he? Um, so, a busy man. Now, what can we do with chitin? Well, we could hydrolyze these amide linkages in a strong basic solution. Bases generally don't uh, cut acetals, but they will cut amides. You boil it in some base, and you could create this long polymer of cellulose, but it's got free amino groups here. And those amino groups will grab onto metals. People have tried to use this material to uh, extract uh, metals out of mine leachates and things like that. But one thing it seems to be really good at is absorbing fat. So you can get these chitosan fat blockers and uh, eat a spoonful with your fatty meal. And this is supposed to sort of like ball up the fat into something your body can't metabolize and it just all comes out the other end. I don't know how pleasant that is, um, but uh, in theory, you could eat fat without getting fat with this chitosan stuff. Don't know if I believe that. Um, I'm sure it absorbs fat in the test tube. I don't know how effective it is at preventing your body from grabbing onto it though. Here's another gel. That's agar. That's an agarose gel. That's, that's obviously an electrophoresis gel. Um, and look how stiff it is. That person's able to hold it in their hand and it's not falling apart. It's a pretty sturdy gel. Agarose comes from seaweed. And here it is. It's a polymer. It's a polymer of CICA, uh, galactose here, and here I see an L-galactose. Notice how every single stereo center is the opposite of this one. And also, we've condensed the uh, uh, primary hydroxyl group, the number six carbon, with the number four carbon here. So we've made this little bridge. So it's, it's an interesting molecule here. It's got interesting properties. One thing it does is it tends to um, obviously form uh, structures that dominate a large region of water. So it's going to be able to form these gels. And so it's a mixture of this uh, regular galactose and L-galactose. Notice how every single stereocenter is the opposite in L-galactose. I think that's neat. And then we have that condensation between this alcohol and that alcohol uh, to form that bridge. Um, so agarose, interesting structure. Um, and and what, it, 
what it gives you is the ability to make gels. And it was discovered in Japan uh, from this seaweed here. Uh, like a, I think chefs in Japan have been using it for a long time. And it came into biochemistry by an interesting story. Here, Walter Hess, he was working in a uh, microbiology lab uh, in Switzerland. And uh, he and his wife were up in the Alps having dinner. And it was a hot day. And she served him some gelled sweets like this. And he noticed they weren't melting. Now, they were trying to grow bacteria on gel substrates. But once you got, you know, heated up to 37 degrees, what did you get? Water. Like everything would melt. But agarose was able to hold the gel at 37 degrees. And so suddenly, he had an idea. So um, agarose gel was born. And of course, uh, Julius Petri here, who developed the Petri dish, combined that with the agarose gel. Suddenly, you've got this wonderful support to grow your gross bacteria on. So there is one of the uh, uses of agarose, as well as in electrophoresis. So that material, you can imagine if you're producing it more efficiently, a little cheaper, you'll be able to make money selling it to uh, the biology industry. Here's another really important commercial product. You might have, if you're uh, walking along the shore of Prince Edward Island after a stormy day, you might see people out scraping up seaweed. They're probably using tractors these days, but there was a romantic time when a lot of people used horses and you drag this cage through the water and scoop up the Irish moss. So, why did you do that? For carrageenan. Irish moss is rich in a polysaccharide called carrageenan. What's carrageenan look like? Well, here it is. It's this polymer, and it's a mixture of, it's a, a galactose polymer. Some of it sulfonylated, some of it bridged. You can see um, how these sulfonyl groups might have formed. You, if you had a sulfonyl group here, this oxygen could attack that, kick out the leaving group, and form that bridge. So you have this sort of long polymer, lots of negative charges, really friendly with water, going to dominate the water, going to gel it up. And it's a pretty common ingredient in ice creams and, and a lot of foods that need a little thickening. And here's a place where you'll often see it, soy milk. I mean, the, the juice you get from, uh, you know, processing soy or almonds is just white water. But you need to thicken it up. So you'll add a whole bunch of chemical thickeners, carrageenan being one of them, to give it that nice milky feel. Here's another uh, important food additive. This is xanthan gum. You see that all the time, xanthan gum. What's xanthan gum? It's a polysaccharide. It's basically just a cellulose-like polymer here. This is just beta-1,4 glucose, so that's cellulose. But it's decorated with these big water-friendly sugar side chains, ending with this negatively charged um, mannose that's uh, condensed with pyruvate with that negatively charged carboxylic acid of pyruvate out at the end, a negatively charged oxidized carbon there and the glucuronic acid uh, mannose here. And notice the linkages, alpha-1,3, beta-1,2. Those are different numbers than we're used to. So there's a large variety of glycosidic bonds that you can make in biochemistry to create specific structures. Um, it's not as regular as I'm presenting here, but on average, about every second glucose on this cellulose is decorated with a side chain like this. And of course, you can see how big and water friendly that is. That would be a great gelling agent. And it's made by lactic acid bacteria that uh, basically create this product uh, as part of their metabolism. And so, of course, through careful husbandry of the bacteria, you can come up with a strain of bacteria that's really good at producing it and turn it into an industrial product. And Aline Jeans, one of the great food chemists, um, was uh, the lady who basically developed the commercial or a commercial synthesis for xanthan gum. She also uh, developed a commercial synthesis for isolating dextran. So dextran for all the solid supports for separating proteins. Um, xanthan gum for what do you do with it? You put it in food to thicken things up. And just pick up any, uh, just pick up anything. Any, everything seems to have xanthan gum in it, or some type of gum, guar bean gum, locust bean gum. Um, so all of those gums are polysaccharides decorated with really water-friendly groups that are able to dominate water and create a nice uh, gel. So as you consider this lecture, think about uh, the nature of polysaccharides and how they are a material that can be extracted, used directly, processed into beer, into explosives, uh, into corn syrup, uh, into the materials that drive our industry and make people billions of dollars. And all along the way, whether you're producing enzymes to do the chemistry, you know, if you want to make invert sugar, you need invertase. Where are you going to get that from? From a company that sells you purified invertase, all specced up. We know exactly how much is in this bottle. We know exactly what it does. And so now, now you know what that enzyme will do. It's part of your recipe now. Um, so you can be part of a company that produces 
the tools for these transformations. You can be a biochemist that supervises or is involved in inventing, inventing new transformations. I guarantee you right now there are people looking at um, new gums. Uh, just constantly looking for organisms that make these gums and if you can come up with a better gum than xanthan gum or a cheaper gum than xanthan gum that's also you know tasteless and has all the same properties or desirable properties you will make tons of money so as I say this was a supplemental lecture it's not something that I expect you to know for the course but think about the examples that you have seen here you have and, and how they apply to everything we've been learning about biochemistry and this is our aperitif for the day this is a uh, one of these uh, molecular gastronomy uh, creations. It's a sangria cocktail made with xanthan gum. So this is uh, one of the things that gums can do. They can change the nature of water and create these gels. So I invite you to check out the uh, references. You can find uh, lots of information on uh, many of the subjects we've talked about and where I got all the pictures from. And I hope you enjoyed this supplement to our lecture on uh, polysaccharides, mostly starch and cellulose, that we had in class. Uh, and have a nice day.